Welcome to Facts on the Ground. I'm Jesse Zerwell, and I'm joined today by journalist and author Vincent Bevins, whose most recent or your first his first book, I should say, uh, the Jakarta only book. Method. Sorry, first only book. book, only book, but that's going to change. The Jakarta Method, Washington's anti-communist crusade and the mass murder program that shaped our world. Uh, which is going to be the crux of our conversation today. Uh, Vincent has reported for the Washington Post, the LA Times, uh, the Financial Times, and other publications. And he's joining us today from Kiev, uh, Ukraine's capital. And uh, we're very happy to have him on. Vincent, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. No, yeah, thank you so much for, for, for having me. So <clears throat> your book, The Jakarta Method, it starts in, or what the title refers to uh, took place in 1965, but I'd like to provide some historical context to that um, as far as some pivotal events that led up to that. And I think starting with the end of World War II, um, is a good launching point when the U.S. came out of World War II as the world's foremost superpower, you could say. And I'm wondering if you, if we can go from there and sort of work up through the 50s and the uh, advent of the CIA and the just savage anti-communist uh, bent that the U.S. took um, as it found its new form. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you think that the end of World War II is a good place to start because I also uh, thought that I basically struck my book in 1945. I don't really deal with anything before. I try to I just sort of treat it as the beginning of a, of a new sort of epoch in history um, because you get um, a pretty good sense of what happens uh, right after World War II. If you reflect on the division of the planet into first world, second world, and third world, and you know, I think a lot of people these days are, are familiar with those terms. And I thought, you know, I, I thought and think that's a really good starting uh, uh, starting point for discussing when it ultimately happens um, in the Cold War. Um, so the third world, although now sort of a derogatory term um, in the English language due to the way that it was misused and, and, and um, used uh, and due to the, 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 the racism of many speakers of the English language, um, started out as a very forward looking and positive project. Um, so the people of the third world were the peoples that occupied the vast majority of the planet's surface. And they were the people that were outside the first and second world. Now the first world led by the United States, as you said, was by far the strongest power on the planet after World War II. Um, we often think of, in the, of, this, of the Cold War in binary terms, that's really wrong. We really have um, the, the United States much more powerful militarily and economically than the Soviet Union in every single way. And the rest of the first world is the rest of the imperialist or formerly imperialist nations of the North Atlantic plus Japan and Australia. So um, countries that are rich um, very much had shaped the global system still uh, did control the global system. Uh, and then now the United States, a relatively young member of this club that is really on top. The second world um, is the uh, group of countries led now from Moscow, either the Soviet Union itself or the countries liberated slash occupied, however you want to think about it, um, by the Red Army in World War II. Um, and they obviously had their own uh, model of development, their own sort of uh, long-term utopian project, which was very inspiring to some to people in the third world, um, uh, not to all of them, but uh, that really had not yet, nor did it ever, end up really shaping the global system. And so the third world were the peoples of Africa and Asia and Latin America, uh, colonized peoples or formerly colonized peoples, um, that got together um, in the belief and the hope that now that formal European colonization uh, had ended, that they would be in a position to take their, their, their rightful place on the world stage, uh, reshape that global order that had really been created by imperialism and capitalism, 
and um, really start a new chapter in world history. Third world was not third as in third rate, it was third as in the third act, the, the third set of people um, moving forward. It was very much a, uh, um, a, a project which inspired peoples of African Asia. Now, by the end of World War II, and in the first years after uh, World War II, by 1947, 48, the Cold War, uh, as we call it, um, had cemented between the first and second world. So the new hegemon, the United States of America, this Western European settler colony in North America dominated by white Christians, um, knew how it was going to deal with the second world. Um, it was going to oppose it in, in every possible. And the CIA was created in this moment when the US really takes over for Britain as the uh, sort of guarantor of, of international liberal uh, uh, rules, basically global capitalism. Because the, the United States didn't have this experience of, of intervening all over the globe and having spies in every corner of the planet and acting uh, covertly to make things happen. That was really something that MI6 had been doing for a long time. CIA was this new organization that could do this. So it is set up right after World War II. And as I said, the goal when it comes to the second the world is very clear. Um, now, what is not clear is exactly how they're going to treat the third world. And this kind of conflict provides the drama at the beginning of the book. Right. And you, you going back to the third world, you refer to it as initially it was a movement um, of, as you say, the, I don't know how you would like to characterize them, but in general, the people, so to speak, the, the regular population, if you will. And as you said, they had these countries that were considered uh, or are considered part of the third world, world still, they had high hopes, if you will, that they could <clears throat> maintain a good relationship with Washington while mm -hmm. also pursuing uh, anti-colonial ends. And that, as we now know, um, was doomed. And I think a lot of that had to do with out of the gate after World War II, the US was obsessed with anti-communism and the containment, as they put it, of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. George Kennan wrote what's now known as the X article in 1947 for foreign policy. And that sort of became the lodestar for Truman's for foreign policy and the Truman Doctrine. And then, as you said, there was this view um, it sort of metastasized into communists every everywhere as being, as you put it, part of a monolithic global conspiracy to destroy the West, uh, ostensibly on behalf of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And going from there, one of the important points you make um, is that in the third world, there were different iterations of communism and anti-colonialism. Um, and even before that, we could see it in China with Mao and um, in Indonesia too, uh, with the, the advent of the Indonesian Communist Party. And then we had McCarthyism and Hoover. And during that time, and I suppose it was, it was before the, the CIA came into being, there were events uh, in Java, for example, and uh, the development of what was called at the time, the Jakarta axiom, uh, which right. the historian uh, Westad has written about, or Westad. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk about those uh, sort of pre-1964, 65 events a little bit, because um, it seems to me that they uh, played a large part in, in fueling what came next. Absolutely. So uh, uh, th th that's a very good question. And before I, I answer it, I want to, you reminded me of a quote from Kennan, because this is something that I didn't put in the book. But I think is is quite interesting. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think you can, as you said, explain U.S. foreign policy um, 
after World War II, um, partially as a result of an ideological commitment to combat communism, right? So this was after McCarthyism, everyone that was left in the US government was a fervent anti-communist. Anybody that, anybody that was not provably fervently anti-communist was expelled from the US government. The United States really became uh, a right-wing uh, uh, geopolitical force after that. So there was the ideological moment where all these guys really believed it. They really believed communism is an international conspiracy that wants to destroy, uh, you know, they want to take your freedom. It's the, it's the same discourse we see much later. Um, but then there was the material dimension too. So the United States really was now the, the guarantor of pr property rights for uh, all the other particip participants in Western-led capitalism. Um, and they were, they, they thought of it in ideological terms, they thought of themselves as defending liberty and being the good guys, but this material, um, this, this material side of the, the coin was re very real as well. And this tended to be particularly important when there was American corporations um, that were perceived to be threatened by some foreign regime. Um, so I want to read this quote from, from Kennan, who was one of the architects of the Cold War, as you, as you pointed out, um, as it comes to Asia. He said this in 1948, and, and I'm quoting, we, the United States, have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. This disparity is particularly great as between ourselves and the peoples of Asia. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without detriment to our national security. To do so, we will have to dispense with all sentimentality and daydreaming, and our attention will have to be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. So he says it quite clearly, he's like, we're way richer than them. That's not going to be something that the rest of the world is going to, to, to like very much. We're going to do whatever it takes to maintain that. And this is, you know, that is arguably the job of a government. You're supposed to take care of the welfare of your, of your, of your, of your people. So as we, as we go forward, uh, this new, the CIA is created. There's all the other organs of, of the national, uh, the United States government, State Department, Pentagon, Presidency, Congress. Um, looking out upon the world, um, they don't know exactly what to do with regimes in the global south, which are anti-colonial and left-leaning, but not communist, right? This is the Jakarta axiom. For a while, it seems like these kinds of regimes can be tolerated. Um, because while for those of us in, in, in my generation or younger, uh, it's very easy to forget this, but basically everybody was left-leaning. I mean, the, the anti-colonial str struggle was was identical with socialism in most of the global south. Uh, it was very hard to find a leader of an anti-colonial struggle that did not want some kind of socialism. And Sukarno uh, is perhaps the emblematic example of this kind of a third worldist leader. Um, the first he, president uh, of Indonesia. Absolutely. Uh, very much the founding father of Indonesia in, in, in a way that is much more true of any of the founding fathers of the United States. He really, um, managed to bring together uh, disparate uh, strands of this, of, of what people believed in this very, very uh, diverse country, um, you know, 13, 15, 17,000 islands across Southeast, Southeast Asia, um, to really create an, an identity of Indonesian-ness, which, which really kind of lives on to this day, despite the, the weird turns that, that, that come later. And this, uh, he, he marries Marxism, nationalism in the anti-colonial sense, uh, and Islam. These to him are the three elements that, that really form what it is to be Indonesia. And in the uh, war that is waged by the Dutch on Indonesia after World War II ends, so the Dutch come back and try to reconquer uh, their former territories. Now, we may remember uh, Indonesia as sort of like the Indies that Columbus was looking for back in uh, uh, 1492. This is where all the spices came from. This was a, a, an integral part of the development of global capitalism. When the Dutch tried to reconquer the, the, the country uh, after World War II ended, um, in, there was a power struggle within the revolutionary forces. The communists uh, uh, ended up losing this power struggle, being called traitors by the more right-leaning uh, elements of the revolution. And the fact that the communists were put down and seemed safely in the back pocket or safely out of the way led um, the US government and Truman administration at the time to believe, okay, this is sufficiently anti-communist. The, the, 
They killed some leftists. Uh, they, he's left-leaning, he's anti-colonial, but they're all, they all are. You know, this is good enough. Um, now, that really changes in 1953 and 1954. And, that, so, and that's what constituted the Jakarta axiom, correct? This yeah, Jakarta axiom is a term yeah, Westad uses, which is that countries which are left-leaning and nationalist but are sufficiently anti-communist, uh, we can deal with them. They're not, you know, we can try to get them as close to us as possible, but they can be, they, they, the, um, they are not enemies. Um, we can, we can, we can, we can live with these regimes, whereas we anyone- Tolerate anybody, them. Yeah, we can live with them. We can try to uh, work with them somehow, whereas any, any regime which is openly uh, Marxist or, or, or communist absolutely must be crushed uh, anywhere around the world. Even though, as you pointed out, a lot of these regimes operated in very, very different ways in the Soviet Union or the way that we told ourselves that the Soviet Union operated in the West. I mean, Ho Chi Minh uh, and Mao, uh, I think you alluded to this, both believed perhaps they could be um, on good terms with the United States. They did not want to be in conflict with the most powerful nation that ever existed, but uh, the United States had different um, ideas. So one of the, one of the most, the, if yeah. I can just interject real quick, yeah. because I want to get this in there. One of the most remarkable post-World War II events, if you want to call it that, is what happened in Greece when the communists there, the uh, many of whom had fought against uh, Nazis, refused to lay down their arms despite Stalin basically commanding that they do so. And then that was crushed and napalm was used for the first time in history, which I did not know until reading your book. But that just speaking to the point um, that we made earlier that there were various iterations of communism and leftist movements that developed around the world after World War II. But I thought that was, uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't, didn't mention that. Yeah. You know, Greece, Greece is a case where it makes a lot of sense if you know how Stalin actually operated, but it totally conflicts the idea that we have about the Soviet Union in, in like the received mainstream wisdom in the West, because Stalin um, did not want to antagonize the United States after World War II. He understood that he was in a very weak position. He, um, he was being very, you know, he was violent, cynically, pragmatic, ruthlessly pragmatic, but he was pragmatic. He did not, he absolutely did not want to activate all leftists around the world to take on, you know, the United States. This was absolutely the opposite of what he wanted to do. He wanted to stick to the deal that had been made during World War II. He did not, he did not. So, so Greece was one place where, even though the United States sort of used it as a pretext to start World War II, he said, no, this is, no, do not continue this rebellion. You have no chance. Um, and then, yeah, Nepal was used uh, for the first time in the Cold War, I think it was developed in World War II and then used briefly in World War II, but definitely the first time in the Cold War uh, that Nepal was used. And um, yeah, the, the, all these things I included because even though a lot of people in like, you know, now I'm in the Russian speaking world, knew know how Stalin actually operated. Um, he was very willing to leave his, you know, people that wanted to be his allies out in the cold for the sort of, uh, for what he perceived to be the interests of the Soviet Union. But we had this idea that, well, everyone around the world is being ordered to try to overthrow every country that exists. And that was not what, that was not what was going, at all, going on at all. Um, and you see this pattern emerge uh, uh, repeatedly also in, in Latin America. Latin America was a part of the, the world where the Soviet Union did not believe that they, it would be behoove them to support revolution. They did not want to stir up trouble in what they perceived and Washington perceived to be Washington's backyard. Um, and yeah, the, the Cold War started really um, <laughs> kind of using these, as, these pretexts, uh, even though this is not a place where Stalin was uh, uh, encouraging revolution, precisely the opposite. And Iran was another another one where, um, and this brings us to, to really what changes the Jakarta axiom into the exact opposite, is that in the first years of, of uh, the CIA's existence, their mission was to take on communism. Now, so they tried to take on the second world. They failed repeatedly. They just couldn't do it. Um, right. And there's they were this- They were sending men to their, yeah. Uh, Frank Wisner, 
I wanted to mention because he features prominently in this uh, this uh, aspect of what we're talking about right here. But um, yeah, continue because I think it's it's important and also very interesting. Uh, the failure and the initial failure of the CIA and then what happened in Iran and right. that becoming so, the, yeah, the so end think, of the Jakarta axiom, so to speak. Yeah, so when, so, those, so they're trying to take on the second world and they just absolutely fail. You know, this, the Soviet Union uh, and China are very well disciplined in self-defensive nation states. I mean, they were both forged in civil war they have, they, they, they don't, there's not a lot of cracks, let's put it that way. And they, they, Wisner, who's the head of the covert operations um, um, division of the CIA, which arguably should have never existed, legally speaking, um, sends men to their death repeatedly in Eastern Europe, and it just doesn't work. And so now they turn their attention to the third world, which even sympathetic biographers of the CIA admit they didn't really understand at all. Now, the first big success of Wisner's operations team, this gang of weirdos, as they were sometimes called in Washington, DC, was Iran. Um, and the issue in Iran, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's boring how often this comes up, but it was oil. Um, the British had uh, considered, um, long considered Iran and Iranian oil, uh, their rightful uh, a sphere of influence. Um, Iran, in its uh, young and imperfect democracy, uh, had a leader, Mossadegh, who was trying to take control of the oil industry. Now, the, the British really pushed the US into supporting and uh, carrying out a coup. There's communists there that could maybe theoretically take over. We have to make sure we have a stable regime there. Um, because the Tuday, uh, a communist party uh, in Iran, was very powerful. Um, very popular I mean, is, is, is a better way to put it. Um, they, they had thought that there was a moment that they could have made a bid for revolution after World War II. And again, Stalin said no. Stalin backed a bunch of other schemes, which turned out quite badly for Iranians and for Soviet Union just in the, in the region. But there is this sort of funny moment, and this, this also comes, happens. The British kind of know that the Americans really care about this communism thing. So the British kind of play up the, the communist threat to get the American money. Because the Brits are sort of like, they've been around longer. They're more sort of uh, 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 jaded about all of this stuff. They know what, they what their interests really are. And they view the Americans as kind of naive, like sort of like uh, uh, yokels, but with, with uh, uh, pockets stuffed with cash. So and this, and the, the, CIA, the CIA weirdos, as you put them in your book, were obsessed and fetishized MI6. There's one section where you discuss how they had a fetish for James Bond and yeah, wanted just, to model yeah, yeah. themselves after that. Yeah, these guys were blue bloods in, in, of the type that we don't really see much of anymore. But these were like upper class Americans, like Anglo Anglophiles that went to schools that were based on the, the great British like uh, boarding schools. Um, and yeah, they really like, had sort of an inferior com inferiority complex when it came to like these British gentlemen. And they were cosmopolitan liberals this is an important thing to understand too. These were not like knuckle dragging conservatives from the deep South that, you know, they, they spoke the language of sort of like the cosmopolitan global elite, right? So, um, so 1953 was the great big success. They overthrow Mossadegh and they, we, the US ends up with a a uh, loyal uh, 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 ally, the Shah, right? Who will be anti-communist, protect uh, uh, economic interests in the regions and really corn form the cornerstone of, uh, of policy in the Muslim world for a long time. This is amazing. Uh, uh, Eisenhower, who's just taken over, as, taken over as president, loves this because he, as sort of a military leader, really hated actual war. You know, the Korean War he thought was was something he wanted to avoid. And he said, well, well I've, you know, we've discovered the cheat code for, for geopolitics. We send in the CIA, we have a coup, we get our allies, this is amazing. So do this again in, in Guatemala in 1954. Um, CIA uh, helps to eject Arbenz, who is a left-leaning, far from, from, from socialist uh, leader of Guatemala that wants to take some more control over Guatemalan land. Um, and this, af in this case, after the coup happens, um, they do instruct the new leaders to execute 
communists. Um, the Communist Party had played an important role in, in, in uh, Guatemalan politics in, in the decades before. Uh, and this is the first time that I know of that, what I later call the Jakarta method is employed, which is the, the intentional mass murder uh, of, of leftists um, with the assistance or um, approval of the United States. And uh, in this case, it was at the orders of the United States, according to, according to testimony from the time. And this is when things really shift. So the Jakarta axiom is out. Now, if you are neutral on the global stage, if you refuse to join an explicit alliance with Washington, um, starting around 1953, uh, you are an enemy. It's basically like you're either with us or you're against us. And these are countries that are explicitly saying, we don't want to be against you. And it doesn't matter. And they were often against us, the United States, without really being told, right? There was, they were often played this double game where they were actively um, working to undermine or destroy these countries, but uh, not telling them. And this is what, what happens in Indonesia in the, beginning of the, in the middle of the 1950s. Uh, Sukarno is um, still the president. Um, the Communist Party, which never went away, it's the oldest Communist Party in, in Asia, it's older than China, um, is doing better and better at elections. And this is a big problem for the CIA. Um, another big problem for the West is that the same year, um, Sukarno puts on the Bandung Conference, Mm -hmm. Which is the real moment that the third world, the the the, the real moment that the third world movement comes into its own. You can watch the, the clips on YouTube, and it's like it's a it's a moment that really inspires countries around the global south, which is now just a term for the third world. Um, so these two things lead the CIA to begin to intervene, and what they do initially is they start funding cash to Masumi, a conservative Muslim party, just to help them to win elections. This is something that has worked in Italy. This is sort of like, and this is something that as I get further away from the book and I forget sort of all the details, this dynamic I think is important because this is one of the things that still is sort of reproduced in US foreign policy. They always want to start with the easy thing. They don't go straight to the nuclear option, right? They don't want to kill uh, a bunch of people or they would rather not do something which is so catastrophic and obvious and traumatic, right? So they start just sort of Let's pay the, these guys and maybe that will tip the scales in their favor and they'll win elections. This doesn't work. The Communist Party continues to do better and better. So by 1958, the CIA creates the largest operation in its history to that point, um, modeled on the success in Guatemala. They foment and then participate in a civil war. And this is something that the Indonesian leaders don't even really know for sure that is happening until... Uh, uh, an, an American pilot crash lands into an island after leading a uh, participating in a bombing campaign, which killed Indonesian civilians. So, and that was Alan Pope. Exactly, Alan Pope. And this was like, again, there's still, if you want to be a conspiracy theorist about this, you can be like, why, what was going on with him being captured? Because he was captured with his identifying papers on him. Some right. people now, I mean, I think it was just, he was maybe either too cowardly or stupid to like, do what you're supposed to do and not carry your your identification maybe you just but some people think this is all you know this is supposed to happen who knows and he was but this is he was working as part of the cia correct yeah he was yeah he was a u.s pilot right so he uh i don't know if he i don't know what his status was within the organization but he was absolutely hired by the agency he worked for one of these yeah there was you know they have these cut out um uh airlines um and they were operating from Singapore often. Um, but yeah, this was the kind of thing they wouldn't do now, right? They had actually an American like bombing uh, uh, the country. And the people on the left of Indonesian politics, the Communist Party, Sukarno in his more nationalist moments. Um, well, that's Sukarno, not yet. Was he really always like this? He, you know, he 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 was all over the place, but the 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 dedicated left of the Indonesian political scene had been saying for a long time, we can't trust the Americans, they're a neo-colonial power, they're going to, they want to crush the global south, look what they're doing, look what they've done assisting the French in, in Vietnam, they're a racist power, they'll never allow us to be truly sovereign. Now, apparently, they've been proven very right. And this is a big moment where Indonesian politics changes because Alan Pope is like dragged out in front of cameras, it's very obvious, we caught the CIA trying to destroy our country. Remember, this nation has only existed for nine years, right? It, it is not clear to these people that decolonization, even in the formal sense, is ever really going to happen. They think, well, maybe the Europeans are going to come back, right? You know, after hundreds of years, they got nine years of formal independence. 
And uh, Sukarno moves closer to the Soviet Union. Doesn't absolutely does not join an alliance with the Soviet Union or become a communist uh, leader, but he comes a little bit closer. Um, in the United States now, instead of directly taking on the Indonesian military, they, sh they shift tactics. Um, instead of actually being at war with Indonesian generals, they bring thousands of them for training to the United States, kind of wine and dine them, form deep uh, uh, partnerships, and explain to them what they sort of hope to see in the rest of the world. They sort of show them the American ideology uh, and um, teach them about the ways that you know military, the military can take part in constructing a modern society. And of course, modern at this time for these men meant sort of a, a capitalist nation, which would be integrated into a US-led order and just kind of copy in the United States. And this is what happens from 1958 to 1964. The, the behind the scenes, the, the military is being trained um, in the United States, the Indonesian military. Uh, as Sukarno um, becomes more assertive on the global stage and, and in some ways stretches himself thin domestically because the economy is not doing so well because he believes that his first job is to finish the task of decolonization in Southeast Asia. And Americans who are you know, thinking more economically, we're, a lot, we're, we're often very frustrated with this because in the short term, the economy was suffering. But he thought, you know, he, again, he's thinking in, well, we had 300, centuries, 300 years to overthrow colonization. We have to do it. And we have to finish that job before we can start worrying about sort of, you know, GDP growth in, in, in quarter two. And things really come to a head um, again uh, after John F. Kennedy uh, is assassinated in, in 1963. Who uh, I think we should mention before his assassination, before his presidency, when he was a congressman, actually took, the, took it upon himself to travel around the world, including to a lot of countries um, that were going through decolonization and or uh, <clears throat> in the communist and or leftist camp, you could say, uh, including Indonesia. Um, yeah. But it seems like his tune changed uh, quite quickly. Um, the more power, the more political power he attained. Um, but Please continue with what you were going to say uh, about JFK. Yeah, yeah, that's an important. That's an important thing to 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 to, to step on to not step <laughs> on, touch on to touch on quickly. Kennedy was a rich kid, and he saw the whole world, and all you know, and he was a self-styled foreign policy guy. So he had conversations with all these leaders of, of the third world. So at the very least, he understood what their deal was. So as a result of this, as a result of just sort of sitting down with these people. He was, by American standards, a relatively pro third world politician. He was one of the few people in the US would, that would kind of stand up and say, well, hey, hold on. Like, we have to understand that they do want independence. We cannot confuse that with, you know, uh, being our enemies or being communists. Um, and so Sukarno, when, when he was elected, was optimistic about this new president. Oh, they got somebody that sort of gets us, right? Remember, of course, of course, the United States styles itself, styled itself as an anti-colonial nation, right? Um, the peoples of the global south were very unsure how, how true this was considering the way that they were acting in Iran and Guatemala, um, events that were very well reported across the global south, not, as, not so well in the United States. And in Vietnam, the very obvious case where they were really helping the, the Vietnamese to prop up, um, to attempt uh, to, uh, to, to reconquer uh, their former territory as the Dutch had uh, attempted and failed. So, but then Kennedy dies. Um, uh, LBJ is not somebody that has been around the world and sat down with left-leaning leaders. Um, he has let much less political capital in Washington. He, he really cares about domestic policy and to a large extent, he sort of lets the, you know, the foreign policy blob, the deep state, the advisors, all the smart guys to, to define uh, sort of to, uh, set foreign policy. And there's all kinds of debates as to what would have Kennedy done if he lived, like, oh, maybe he was trying to scale back the Cold War. Ah, but for me, after the Bay of Pigs, he really, at the very least, materially, who knows what he's doing, thinking behind the scenes, absolutely backs intervention all over the place. He also had, but in Indonesia, huh? he also had DM rubbed out as well. 
Yeah. And I mean, he, he didn't want it to go down that way, but he was absolutely responsible for the coup that removed Diem from, was Diem? Sorry. Uh, I always forget if it's the, how, the, like, if I should try to pronounce it right, or, I don't know. Um, uh, have him removed from power and then ultimately killed. And um, the, uh, but in the case of Indonesia, this is something that would have gone different, differently if Kennedy had not died. Um, so as a result of LBJ taking over, the aid that had been, uh, uh, the, the, the aid deal um, that was, uh, uh, that Sukarno relied upon was something that uh, LBJ was not willing to support in Washington politically, uh, uh, and he just didn't get it, right? So uh, ultimately the strategy of remaining kind of friends with Sukarno, which had re-emerged in the 1958 to 1964, 1963 period, falls apart. And the ambassador in Indonesia that understands Indonesia very well, Howard Jones, uh, uh, he's very alarmed by this. He's, he, know, he believes in his memoirs, he says, I know that JFK would have kept going. I'll be just, he deferred in, in carrying out coups. Um, And uh, in 1965, there are worm, rumors swirling around Jakarta. There are, everyone believes that something's about to happen. Uh, and, you know, I, I met a lot of people that lived through this period um, reporting the book, and they all report hearing all kinds of whisperings and gossip about there's going to be this, there's going to be that coup. Now, we now know some things about what CIA and MI6 are doing in this period. Um, the full files are still not uh, declassified, but... The CIA and MI6 were agitating covertly behind the scenes to create a clash between the very popular uh, but unarmed Communist Party and the very well-armed Indonesian military, knowing very well what happens when an unarmed and an armed group clash. Now, it's important to, to mention really quickly, the Indonesian Communist Party would have come first place in an election in this period, but elections um, uh, in the ways Elections stopped happening the ways that we would consider legitimate after 1958, but everybody knew that they would have won. Um, something like 25, 30% of the country was, was uh, closely affiliated with the party. Um, and so they're covert covertly agitating behind the scenes for this clash. And in uh, 1965, in ways that we still don't uh, understand entirely, this clash does happen. Um, and when this clash happens, uh, immediately, uh, a general named Suharto, which is who is re relatively unknown, steps in to take emergency control of the country, even though Sukarno is still around and technically should be um, uh, 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 above him on the chain of command. And he and Western intelligence agencies and Western media spread a bizarre but incredibly effective propaganda story about what the Communist Party had done and had planned to do, and this story is used to justify rounding up and arresting a million or two uh, leftists and accused leftists in the end of 1965 and 1966. About one million of these leftists remain in jail in concentration camps until the 70s, um, and 500,000 to a million are killed, um, taken out at night stabbed, thrown into rivers, um, disposed of. Um, um, and this violence uh, is not something that the Suharto regime did uh, wantonly uh, uh, um, out of revenge. It did this so that it could take power and consolidate its regime. Um, this, this violence eliminated the, the most, the most uh, um, vocal and committed supporters, supporters of Sukarno and the left-leading vision for Indonesia that he had created, that's the Communist Party, um, decimated their organization and made anybody who was even two degrees removed from them terrified into doing anything because these people were not just killed, they were disappeared, which meant that your friend, your family member, your husband went away and then you just never heard. So you thought maybe they're coming back. And this terror, was incredibly effective for silencing what just months earlier had been almost the official discourse of, of the country. I mean, the Communist Party and, and its leftists 
allies had really been sort of, you know, it was as okay to be a communist as it is okay to be a huge fan of Kamala Harris right now. I mean, it was like, it was, you were not in some re secret revolutionary cell in the jungle, you know, planning attacks on, on, on the post office. You were working at the post office and in a member of the communist party. So this violence decimates um, the largest communist party in the world and allows General Suharto to take over. Now, as soon as he does, aid starts flowing to him. The US consolidates support behind him. He's given carte blanche to do whatever he wants, basically, as long as he keeps oil, uh, uh, again, um, uh, open to US investment and remains a staunch anti-communist ally in the Cold War, which he absolutely does. And he becomes, you know, welcomed with open arms into the community of so-called uh, the, the so-called free world. He is one of the most important Western allies in in the global South for the next for another next decades. And as I um, then trace throughout the rest of the book, this kind of thing, uh, the intentional mass murder of leftists or accused leftists in the service of creating um, violent authoritarian capitalist regimes happens many more times throughout the Cold War. Um, and in some places they explicitly drew inspiration from what happened in Indonesia in 1965. And in other places, it seems clear that they learned the lessons of other white right-wing regimes, right-wing movements that had, had taken power in the decades previous. Because we often forget, just like this, there's this escalation where you start, you start with the, the easy thing, you go to the more intense thing. All these anti-communist groups, all these right-wing right -wing movements, often in connection with it, you know, often being coordinated through Washington or sometimes coordinating horizontally, they talked, they traded tricks, they knew what worked, and they uh, accumulated this sort of set of terrible knowledge, this, uh, this sort of uh, war chest of, of, of plays and, and, and scripts and, and tactics that they used to increasing um, efficacy throughout the Cold War. Um, and they really won, I think, in the Global South, um, partially as a result of this particular tactic that I focus on, which is the intentional mass murder of innocent civilians. And after he was deposed, so to speak, what happened to Suharno? So Sukarno. Uh, Sukarno, sorry. Yeah, no, Sukarno was in a, I think he said it right. Sukarno was in a strange position for a few months where he was technically the president, but Suharto and the army were just running the country. Um, and then eventually, and, and in this period, we have now ample documentation that the State Department was pushing um, Suharto to, to consolidate power and to push Sukarno aside and to uh, crush the left, knowing very well that the way that they were crushing the left was to round them up and, and murder them in mass. Um, the more extreme, the most extreme uh, example we have of, of of participation is is the U.S. Embassy handing over lists of people that needed to be killed and then um, confirming them that they with, with the military that they were killed. But really, the whole thing you have to understand um, happens as a result of what the Indonesian military thought that Washington wanted them to do, um, uh, and what they thought they had to do to get the support and uh, uh, aid that was coming from Washington. And and at every 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 chance possible, Washington supported. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Washington confirmed this view of what the Indonesians believe that they should be doing. They, they, uh, they certainly, they certainly never stepped in to to correct them. Um, and then they ended up being being proved right that they they were rewarded for this. Um, um, and um, Sukarno behind the scenes uh, is in a, a, a strange sort of lame duck position until ultimately he is pushed to resign uh, in March of, of 1966. I believe it's March 11th. Uh, there's, again, there's, this is right for theorization. Like the original copy of this letter that he signed is not there. Uh, we have, Indonesia has a copy of it. So no one knows what exactly happened, but it doesn't matter because he had lost concrete power because the military had, had taken over and just um, ignored his direct orders starting back in uh, 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 October 1965. And so they, they took over and then he was pushed aside and then he 
moved up into the distance and died not long after. Um, and and uh, the the new Suharto regime re sort of made anti-communism like another one of the national religions. It was it really became a foundational uh, ideology for for the country of Indonesia, and this continues to this day. So to this day, it is illegal to do anything that can be construed as sympathetic to to communism. Um, people get thrown in jail for this. People get thrown in jail with this as an excuse, like an environmental activist uh, when I was um, re reporting there um, was was jailed for under this pretext. Um, it really was the sort of one of like a creative, like the the creation myth of the of the Indonesian state in the, in the Suharto era that I'm defending you from communism, uh, and uh, they're the you know they are not only. Uh, Bad for the country. They're evil. They're satanic. They are murderous. They're torturous. Um, sexually perverted. Um, yeah, and this and, and this to, to a large extent continues to this day. Many of the survivors that I interviewed for the book still live with this stigma uh, now in 2021. So, I definitely want to talk about the exporting of the Jakarta method, especially to South America and Latin America, but two points I want to hit on real quickly that I think are important are the first being that before the before Suharto um, took over there were Indonesians who could see this coming and I'm thinking of the uh, individual I think his name is pronounced Zane uh, I could be wrong. Z a i n. Yeah, Zain. Zain. That's what Zain. Um, yeah, he would just happen to be the husband. Yeah, yeah. And right, and this is he. He was uh, the husband of one of the individuals whose story you tell in in your book, and he worked for a paper called the People's Daily, and they paid a lot of attention to what was happening in Guatemala, which we just talked about. And he feared that that was coming to Indonesia um, almost, not that he prophesized it, but he could, he could see ahead that it, it, there was a very good chance of that coming to Indonesia. Uh, so I thought that was a very um, quite poignant, uh, it's more than an anecdote, but just this sense that there were people who were aware that something was going terribly wrong in other parts of the world. And because of their political situation, they could see that they were, you know, <clears throat> their country was ripe for the same thing happening. So I thought that was uh, quite remarkable, that, that prescience that Zain had. And then I also wanted to mention too, and you mention it in your book, that there was a huge strain of racism behind all of this. For example, when uh, the Bandung conference took place, there were um, those Americans in the State Department, for example, I believe it was the State Department, they called it the dark town strutters ball. So I just think that's an important point to hammer home as well that this wasn't just about anti communism, but there was a uh, a sense of racial superiority that was guiding mm -hmm. it as well. Um, but shifting uh, back to the, the exporting of the Jakarta method, so to speak, um, can you first talk about where that name came from and then how it made its way over to um, Chile, for example, and then back to Latin America? I suppose you could say, uh, not that it really ever left. Right. So Jakarta as a figure of speech, meme, metonym that signified the intentional mass murder of leftists appears on the streets of Santiago, Chile in 1972 in quite a shocking way. This was a terror campaign, one of many carried out by the far right groups that received direct or indirect backing from the United States during the Salvador Allende regime. So I traced back who in that group, well, with a lot of help from Chileans that knew, you know, because 
there's still people still alive that tell me, oh, I look into this guy, look into this guy. Um, I traced who probably had that idea. Um, probably the Croatian, the guy of Croatian descent, I'm Yuri, Yuri Domic, who, you know, I would guess probably had some links to Lustisha. Um, but the, the, the reason they chose Jakarta was because it was scary. Everybody knew about this. Everybody knew this was something, number one, you could do and that it worked, right? So if you were a far right, you know, it was, it's very, I mean, I think it's really a lot like the ways that kind of Proud Boys or whatever, or these kinds of uh, sort of adventurous little like right wing cells uh, talk about helicopter rides, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody knows that Pinochet had done this. It's kind of a shocking thing to say. It's very terrifying, except in, these, in this case, these guys end up um, contributing to a coup that really does happen in, in, in Chile. And, and, and so there's, there's, a, there's a campaign of graffiti on the walls of Santiago that says Jakarta is coming or just Jakarta, or they would send postcards to uh, government officials in the Allende regime or leftists or members of the Communist Party or people they perceive to be leftists that would say Jakarta is coming or just Jakarta. And in 1973, um, after the CIA assassin uh, successfully removing Salvador Allende, the democratic elected socialist president, um, and Pinochet takes over or was part of a junta, uh, Jakarta does come. They do kill the people that they said they were going to be killing. Um, and this is this is when the term desaparecidos sort of comes into the lexicon of <clears throat> these uh, terror campaigns. And as you said, uh, in Jakarta, that was the method that was used, disappearing people as opposed to killing them in the open. Yeah, the desaparecidos is a word that we now have um, in English. Um, that we understand what it means because of the amount of times that it was used in Latin America during the Cold War. And I believe I, I do my best to trace where it may have entered Latin American countries in the Cold War. I think that it might have started for the first time uh, in the Cold War in Indonesia in 1965 and 1966. And then it arrives in Guatemala and Venezuela soon after uh, in Venezuela. Sorry. In, in, uh, um, at the same time that some people have moved from US uh, um, positions in Southeast Asia to positions in, in, in those countries. So um, disappearances start being used as, as a means of terror in, in 1966 in Latin America. Um, and Pinochet kills uh, thousands of people soon after um, taking over in 1973. Now, um, Soon after Pinochet takes over, um, Chile gets together with Brazil and many other South American dictatorships to form something called Operation Condor, which is an international mass murder network, which is created to uh, take out the enemies or the perceived enemies of um, authoritarian capitalist regimes in, in South America. And uh, it is officially uh, formed um, in 1975, I believe. But throughout the 1970s, Operation Condor member countries kill tens of thousands of people and disappearances uh, are a very common way that this happens. Um, yes, the use of helicopters to drop people into the ocean is, is, is common. This, interestingly enough, is something I think that it, it can be traced to um, French counterinsurgency in Algeria. Um, and then in the 1980s, as Central America becomes the problem zone or the perceived problem zone for US officials, um, Operation Condor officials come up to, to Central America to train um, those dictatorships uh, in counterinsurgency and the, what I would call, uh, state terror and suppression of, of left-wing movements. And this is also when the we 1980s. see uh, the School of Americas come onto uh, the stage. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and in the in the eighties, we see uh, hundreds of thousands of people, innocent people, killed in in Central America. Guatemala being the worst case, and this is where I where I also go to meet a lot of the survivors. Um, so yeah, by the end of the Cold War, you see this tactic employed in in in, in more than twenty countries. Um, and as I said before, I think it really contributes to the way that the Cold War was won and the type of world that the Cold War 
um, created. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning too that although it's hard to say officially um, that the Jakarta method or at least an iteration of it was exported to the Middle East as well. And I'm referring to uh, Saddam Hussein and the US is uh, putting him into power. And when they did that, they provided him with, the CIA provided him with a list of uh, Communist Party members and other ostensible enemies so that he could have them hunted down and killed. So we see it, we saw it, uh, we see it a lot more in South and uh, Central America, but um, I think there's an argument to be made that it also uh, wound up in the Middle East. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Iraq, I mean, the story of Arab socialism uh, and U.S. foreign policy response to it is a big part of my, my second book uh, that I'm working on now. That's why I'm here in, in Ukraine. But absolutely, the case of 1963 in Iraq is on the map of the, of the list, or sorry, of the, um, the, what I call the Jakarta method in the Cold War. The, the, it seems the, the CIA also handed over lists to the first, uh, to the uh, short-lived Ba'ath regime uh, that took power out in, in the 1963 coup. Um, and, and, and I interviewed somebody uh, that lived through this, an Iraqi journalist that was in the party at the time, the very popular, again, Communist Party. Um, uh, and absolutely that, that changed the course of Iraqi history. And uh, certainly US interventions in, in the Middle East throughout the Cold War um, have consequences that we're still living with today. Right. And uh, I can't help but think of uh, Afghanistan in the 80s as well, where the CIA backed, uh, funded, uh, armed and trained uh, Mujahideen. They were rounding up and executing communists there as well uh, in their fight against the, as part of their so-called fight against the Soviets. So yeah, I think there's yeah. an ar argument to be made that it was exported to, uh, I suppose you could say, um, Western Asia, if you want, uh, but Afghanistan specifically. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's one of the that's one of the more better known interventions that the U.S. makes, right? And this is a really, again, this is something that's seen as really successful. The, the CIA intervention in Afghanistan is seen as something that's very successful. And then the U.S. government itself, in interesting ways, later sees this as something with unintended consequence. I think Hillary Clinton comes out in a, and and uh, uh, talks about the, the link between um, CIA oper operations in the 80s to sort of problems that she perceived to be facing in the war, war on terror. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's one that the people know quite well. Um, uh, and, and certainly Afghanistan is not out of the woods right i mean it's hard it's it's um it's really one long uh, uh uh story that goes back to to the cold war um but i don't focus so much on, on afghanistan in the book yeah, yeah it's um but absolutely it's part of the story yeah and and we still see uh i think versions of the jakarta method playing out today uh albeit in different ways. And I'm thinking of the, the so-called color revolutions um, that we've seen in Ukraine, where you are, um, the ones that uh, the US and its uh, proxies are trying to foment in China. And, um, you know, I keep saying there are arguments to be made, but I think there is an argument to be made that 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 these color revolutions are sort of descendants of the Jakarta method and um, perhaps more refined versions and maybe not so much involving mass murder, but um, certainly campaigns that are being carried out in favor of right-wing regimes. Well, what I would say is that the exercise or, of- I, I, I yeah? suppose you, you could say at this point, neoliberal regimes. 
Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it varies. I mean, sometimes it doesn't matter so much um, what the regime is that will come in as much as, you know, sort of um, smashing a perceived or, or, or a real geopolitical enemy in the United States. But what I would say um, about that relationship is that um, U.S. hegemony continues to be exercised, uh, of course, after the Cold War ends in much more, I would say, robust and uh, comprehensive form. And what that means is that uh, there is a wider set of mechanisms through which the most powerful country on earth can nudge the rest of the countries on earth into positions that it would like to see them take. Um, so back in the 50s and 60s, it was very easy to sort of like look at the CIA as the thing that was doing the things. And this all became very infamous um, after 1975 when uh, the, the government leads an investigation into what the CIA had done, shocking a lot of people, including in the government. Um, but now there are uh, a wide set, a wider set of organizations and tactics that can be employed um, and because the hegemony is more firm, and at least it certainly has been for most of the time since 1990, um, it, it, it uh, is less necessary to take things to extremes in the way that often happened uh, um, in the 50s and 60s. Now, that's not to say that that, that doesn't happen as well. Uh, you know, you have the outright invasion of Iraq. You have the constant bombing of countries in the in the Muslim world. Yeah, and the but, the um, and, but the I would say now, just to finish that thought, is that you don't need just because the CIA is not involved doesn't mean the, CIA, the U.S. isn't doing something, and just because the CIA is doesn't mean that it's sort of a murderous regime change operation. There's the the the. The U.S. has gotten more, much more of a uh, sophisticated imperial power. Let me put it that way. Yeah, and I think cutouts, uh, CIA cutouts, like the National Endowment for Democracy, um, are part of that refinement that you just mentioned as far as tactics um, on the U.S.'s part. So just to wrap, the last section of your book is titled, Where Are They Now and Where Are We? Mm -hmm. And you essentially look at what the, uh, the title of that section is um, with regard to Indonesia and, and Guatemala. So I'm hoping you can just talk about that a little bit and kind of bring us up to where we are at the present um, with regard to the countries that were sort of at the center of the Jakarta method. Right, well, the really simplistic way to summarize the answer to that question is that the global south did not get what it believed it would get during the time of the third world movement there was absolutely not a reformulation of the rules of the global economy that would allow the, the formerly colonized peoples of planet earth to take more power and control over the way that it operates precisely the opposite happened you had something that would i believe would be called now a neo-colonial uh, international order by people like Sukarno. Um, and that is the sort of broad structural way to answer your question. And the more sort of granular um, human way to answer your question is that the people that suffered through these things in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s are still suffering. I mean, you go to the village of Guatemala where um, almost everybody was murdered by the military in the 80s for being communist, which just really meant that they were from the wrong indigenous um, community. Uh, these people are still marginalized, uh, 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 ignored, and uh, exploited by the global economic system and living on a very personal level with the trauma that was inflicted upon them. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, also true in Indonesia, as I mentioned. This stigma is real, but really um, uh, still with the people that uh, lived through and continue to survive. Um, this horrible atrocity committed against them in 1965 and 1966. And, you know, just because it's on my mind, they text, you know, the head of one of the victims organizations in Solo texted me the other day saying they're running out of money again, they can't pay rent. And like mm -hmm. rent for a year to, to, to keep this center going is less than a thousand dollars. So I'm gonna try to raise that, but like, um, 
yeah, it's a, it is both at the structural and very intimate level, something that, that is still um, with these people. Yeah, and I think um, on that note, it's, it's worth mentioning the two films, The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence, which you uh, touch upon in the introduction to your book and um, were made as, I suppose, ways for both the victims and perpetrators of what happened to, to reckon with what happened, um, not necessarily to provide any sort of closure, um, as if that were possible. Uh, so I just bring those up because I think if uh, people want to know more about this and, and the legacy of it, how it's still reverberating today, um, those are two important films to watch, um, especially the first one, which uh, is almost uh, dystopian in a way, um, both in the way it's yeah, made. I, I, I couldn't rewatch it, I, I saw it once, like eight years ago, before I even knew what Indonesia was. Mm -hmm. And I told myself that I was going to rewatch it to, when I finished up the book to like cite something or to just to rewatch. And I couldn't, <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was too much. So uh, yeah, it's a very, very powerful film. We put it that way. Yeah. So I think that's a good place to wrap. And uh, Vincent, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, from Ukraine to, to join me for this episode. So our guest today has been uh, Vincent Bevins. His first book, The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World uh, is what we discussed today. And it's out now in fine bookstores everywhere. And I definitely recommend reading it. And um, Vincent, thank you again for joining us and uh, good luck on the new project. And I hope we can speak again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for anybody that, that still has interest in this book. I, uh, I've been really, really gratified to see people care about this story. So, so thank you to, and anybody else uh, uh, that picks it up. Okay, take care. All right, thank you very much.